Welcome, everyone. And I'm really excited and happy to be here. And I'm going to be sharing some of the um, lessons that we've learned at F5 as we've tried to like secure and manage our GitHub repositories. And I'll also be sharing some of the work that we've contributed as part of the Open Source Security Foundation in that effort. And my name is Christine Abernathy, and I lead the Open Source Program Office, or the OSPO, at, at, at F5. And uh, this talk might be of interest to you if you are also working in an OSPO in some capacity, or perhaps you're an open source uh, project maintainer, and you're trying to figure out how you can actually better improve your security posture. So um, I don't know about you, but you know, sometimes um, in my life as a roommate, um, you find all kinds of folks. You find those people who like, just leave my mess alone because I know where to find things. But when you're thinking about uh, things like GitHub management, there are certain things that you want to kind of get under control. You can go from unmanaged all the way to control, but when you are actually in a state where things are a little chaotic, it might be a lot harder to not only just discover things from an external community, but also from the inside if you're actually trying to manage your projects, that could be a challenge. And in addition to that, this is something that you cannot just wish away. So, um, and where does like, when you're thinking about um, security, if you can't even find the things, this is a stat that if you've sort of like been around or paying attention in a lot of these different talks, you might have seen something like this from a Sonotype report saying that cyber attacks are on the rise and it's not like slowing down. So this is something that you wanna take a, a look at because as you think about the supply chain, this might be something that you is a part of what you are thinking about, especially if you are working in an OSPO. So a part of the supply chain actually work goes through source code, and this might be the responsibility of an OSPO. And it means that beyond like just solving problems about observability or people discoverability, the OSPO should be aware of what's in your GitHub portfolio and how those things are being run. And so as a young OSPO at F5, or just like about two years old, this was one of the things that we started working and thinking through. Um, what is in our GitHub orgs and how, what should we be thinking about it? As we looked at some of the challenges um, and we were building our initial open source strategy, it's actually pretty clear that GitHub orgs, um, I mean, it's kind of like makes sense because when you come from like different acquisition and different product groups and there is no centralized place to manage, things are just gonna go all over the place. It's, 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 it, it's a given. So um, the good news is that a lot of, before we got there as part of the OSPO, a lot of these orgs had been actually put together under one GitHub Enterprise account, so at least we knew what we were working from, other than them being all over the place. But you know, there were definitely still some challenges. There were, we found that there was basically, there was really no consistent policy around what people should be should be doing in the different orgs. Everyone might be doing things differently. No standard process for how we release projects. People might do things differently in one org versus the other, but there was nothing really that was standardized across. So everyone was kind of doing things their own way. And you know, if no one knows how repos are being managed or what's going on, people sometimes they want to get their code out there. They're just going to find the path of least resistance. And, uh, and get something out there. And that could be problematic, whether it's just like um, leakage of IP or some things that hasn't gone through the proper approval process. Because some orgs are really good about going through the approval process, but some were not. Um, and then you got like operations teams who were basically tasked with provisioning re um, repos and orgs at times, but sometimes they didn't know what they should and should not be doing from an open source context. And even as you look, um, if you're an OSPO and you're actually looking at GitHub, you want to set up a new org, there are all these controls and knobs and, and you're like, what should I be doing? What should I turn on? Which checkbox should I be using? So it can get quite complicated. And then we also knew that as another challenge that would come in the future is if you are actually going to be uh, adding and enforcing and doing these guidelines, there were some people who are already in the org. And if you are going to diminish or revoke access that should or should not have been there, you could probably get some people a little mad. And so you wanted to make sure you didn't slow down existing uh, folks who are working if they needed to continue working while making sure that things were being managed in a secure fashion. So it was quickly obvious. Um, that we needed to establish kind of like a consistent policy and a consistent approach to not just compliance security but just governance and how you work in the community. So the rest of this talk is basically just going to focus on mainly the security aspects and seeing how we can, we can kind of all fit in. 
So um, it's not a secret to put many people that source code is actually pretty important. And if you're not paying attention to how you configure or how you're managing your GitHub organizations and your repos and all and your and your members, uh, you, you're probably going to elevate its security risk. And uh, this is from uh, supply chain uh, levels for software artifacts. It's just like a nice diagram. And there was a talk yesterday um, from folks from uh, Google that actually kind of like walked through in the context of figuring how you can work scorecard. They walked through the different pieces of like how is a typical open source project put together and where do the dependencies come in. But if you have a project, uh, you're usually an open source project, you're going to create a, an open source project, you're typically not going to build everything your own. There's probably going to be dependencies that come in. And then eventually the person who actually consumes it at the end is probably going to consume it through a, a package manager. So along the software supply chain, there's going to be like various places where threats can come in and attack vectors can come in. And we're going to look at um, a few of those in the context of why it's important. So uh, the salsa framework, it just actually uh, divides things nicely into what you could consider source threats, what could be like dependency threats, and then what could be like build-related threats. And we're just going to talk about a few of them. But when it comes to like source threats, it could be just somebody, just unauthorized change that might come in, or uh, you know, compromise the source repo itself is compromised in various ways, or uh, the build is actually happening from something that's modified, uh, a modified source. And they've got uh, like a lot, and Sauce itself, it's got a good website, got like a lot of different lists of things that you could be paying attention to. But in the case of an example like source integrity, is it what actually the producer of the open source software intended, or did something uh, happen? And sometimes intended could be a, a loaded word based on, uh, and you'll see an example of this. But um, I'm just going to look at just a couple of uh, examples in here. Somebody got grabbed a little pot of gold from uh, Ethereum, and basically they were able to um, send in a, a change request, and that change request accordingly or supposedly wasn't actually properly reviewed. And one of the key things is if you've actually got any code out there, you probably want to have good review. And um, through that effort, they were able to actually get in and change, make some changes that eventually led to um, some crypto uh, wallets actually being stolen. There's an also another attack where the developer, in this case, intentionally actually introduced uh, code into their own uh, repo, and this uh, downstream actually affected a lot of different applications. Um, so there's, uh, and these are popular packages, and these can come in. So what are ways that you can actually um, mitigate this? There's various things. That, that on a high level, uh, you can actually go in and kind of like tighten your access control, who has actually access to the GitHub repo. It doesn't mean that it's going to solve a lot of these things, but uh, that's one of the key concerns. Who, um, do you have two-factor authentication? Luckily, thankfully, GitHub is going to make that mandatory, so we won't have to worry about that in the future. In addition to that, for the people who are actually in the organization, what kind of like, um, access do they have? What are the, based on their roles, should they actually even have those access? So you can go in and GitHub and lock down those privileges. And when you're thinking about like code security itself, um, there are some things that you need to be mindful of. Uh, code reviews should happen, and if they're not happening, uh, that's actually a key concern. And even if it's, it's happening, um, are you protecting your branches? So that's kind of like one of the key things in there. Um, so if you're going to have code reviews, you obviously, yes, there's a lot of pro open source pro projects out there that are single maintainers, so that could be like of concern. Uh, who you're going to bring in from the community that you trust who's actually going to be doing a, a good code review. And in addition to that, um, GitHub also has um, um, uh, features out there that can help you do things like detect for secrets. It can actually help you um, allow people to um, responsibly actually report vulnerabilities in your, in your code, and you want to do this in a responsible way, so they have uh, the ability to do things like private reporting. But there's various other things that uh, you can do as well. So. Uh, there's ways that you can actually manage this. Another thing that I want to touch on is that dependency threats. So dependency threats, this is where um, nobody's going to, again, build codes from scratch. They're obviously going to take in packages into it. So there could be like um, examples where dependency are compromised. And I touched on one in the past. But here's a couple more that you've seen, uh, or probably have heard of, like EventStream is a popular uh, NPM package. At the, um, and what happened is that through social engineering, 
the maintainer actually, um, somebody get, gained the trust of the maintainer and they just handed over like, the uh, control of the repo and then through that introduced um, some malicious code which then affected a lot of folks downstream. So you're bringing in uh, or taking in a malicious package. And then another example where there's like, um, this is where the NPM uh, credentials were hacked and uh, account takeover was happened. So somebody then p published a malicious package in UA Parser, which is another popular library. And so these things can happen. So you as a maintainer who's actually taking in these projects, what are you going to do about this? How are you going to actually mitigate for some of these things? Well, in terms of GitHub, um, you can actually configure things both in an organization level at GitHub and also at a repository level. But the things that you can do to help with that is, is like um, you can actually uh, scan for dependency update or even just look for any vulnerabilities. So you have the ability, if you configure GitHub, to actually turn on these um, these uh, things, so you could then get notified via email when these vulnerabilities occur, but you can also have pull requests that could be automatically opened on your behalf, and then you as a maintainer who may not have that much time can just go in and accept it. It's not always easy to update dependencies, especially if there becomes like a breaking change, but at least you can at least know what's uh, going on. So. There are actually also within the Open Source Security Foundation, there are other working groups that are thinking about a lot of these things and how do you do uh, um, security incident response team, how do you think about that, what are some of the package managers thinking together, so like a securing software repositories working group I believe it's called, so they're thinking a lot about how as package managers they can uh, holistically think about helping and, and making sure that the software supply chain is a lot easier and then things like supply chain integrity they think about things like the Salsa framework, uh, S2C2F, and all of these things. There was another really good talk, panel discussion a couple of days ago that dove into, into that topic as well, and identify security threats. So these are all Open Source Security Foundation uh, groups that are thinking about these topics. So hopefully I've convinced you at least at a very quick level because there are a lot of talks that go into detail about this, why you should be thinking about GitHub configuration and standardizing your org. So on the F5 side, when we started, we had a vision. What we wanted to do is we wanted to make sure that in the future that we would be following industry best practices around how you do source code management. So I'll talk about why that was a little tricky to find out first. We also wanted to find what are the best practices. We want to make sure that any of our new projects and any of our strategic projects were actually going to be um, actually uh, adhering to these best practices that we found out. And we do, uh, wanted to believe that we had the tools and the processes in place that, that people could actually remain compliant. I wanted all of our new projects to be following these new streamlined processes and then make sure that they were actually going to be like, uh, that we were just like going to be setting them up for success. Um, and then also on the flip side, even though it's not really about security, but also help better support the community. So as we started off, um, we actually just focused on, spent a lot of time on the requirements phase, just gathering information and making sure that we're able to um, plan for this. It was not really like a linear path, so we, uh, at some point we did like proof of concepts and tried it out in a few organizations. And the other thing that we had the opportunity to share some of our learnings with the OpenSSF um, new project that kind of kicked off. So I'll go through each of these phases and chat about them. So when it comes to like just uh, defining, um, we kind of created a, a guide document, kind of like an initial, like not a you must do it, but you know, you should, or um, just like a guideline document, just our listing all of the different configurations that we think every new organization, existing organization, repositories and maintainers should follow. And we tested it through a couple of uh, initial like repos just to kind of prove out what we were thinking was correct with a couple of maintainers. We then uh, run an audit on some of our key organizations just to see how we were doing, just like as a baseline. And then we also created like a core, small working group to just look through the, the guide documents and see how we were doing. And uh, as I said, we uh, share some of our work with the OpenSSF. I'll just kind of talk a little bit briefly about some of these. So um, in the guide document, like I said, we, we found like um, a nice little handle tool called Legitify. So Legitify <laughs> is uh, also have like an open source project and uh, you'll get a chance to see it in action in a little bit, but it's able to recommend some of the things that you should be doing when you're thinking about like the security posture of your, of your whole so-called GitHub assets, your orgs, your repos, and your members. So we ran that tool in and that actually helped us kind of get like a, a quick baseline of a document. And then after that, 
Uh, based on that, we tested it out on a brand new organization that we had at F5 with a, a project called Unovis, uh, which is a data visualization library. So through that, we just worked with the maintainer to see how is this working for you with these brand protection rules, because there's like a lot of check boxes that you can tick. How does it work for you if you're like two maintainers, one maintainer, three main, what is it? So we walk, walk through that and then uh, alongside that, with Legitify, we also used Scorecard. So, and Scorecard just allows you, again, to run, get kind of like a score, it's like a, a weighted average of, of how are you doing on all these different, like about 19 checks that are in there. And again, you'll see it in, in action in a little bit. So through that, we were able to get a, a document together. We ran through some uh, metrics to see how we were doing as a baseline. And then after that, um, we then got community help um, to kind of like help us push this through. So we had like a bunch of stakeholders. Nginx is, um, uh, F5 is, is uh, part of F5, and Nginx is a big open source project. And they're one of our key stakeholders, so working closely with them. They were already on the path of doing some of this in parallel as well, but working hand in hand with them to, start to prove out what should the document uh, look like. And then we also found other people through an internal program that F5 has called the F5 Open Source Ambassador Program. These are like uh, open source enthusiasts within F5 who want to promote the culture. A lot of them came on board to help us go through the document and make sure that we were doing the right thing. Um, we always found like new orgs and people would come out of the woodwork where we would find like, oh, there's yet another org and they're kind of doing things differently and uh, we need to think about their needs because it's still valid. And so uh, that was a, an interesting exercise. And then also there's like some open source projects that are commercially supported and then some that are not and then you have to consider some of those needs as we thought about uh, things like how do you do security reporting. And uh, again, uh, we just basically, at some point, if you've ever had a project, your requirements can go on and on and on and on and on. So we had needed a way to just like scope this down and make sure we kind of got things going. And then uh, really like uh, at the same time we were kind of kicking off this project, Legitify and Gnome had come in and they wanted to um, use some of their work to create a source, co a source code management best practices guide. So this like perfect storm, we're able to work together where we gave them feedback from F5 and they just took that and we together worked together to actually create a, um, a guide document. So we're able to actually collaborate and share our work. So um, for those who don't know what the OpenSSF is, and we've got some folks in the front row who are <laughs> experts in that so they can keep me honest, but this is under the Linux Foundation a couple of years old, and uh, they're thinking about a uh, holistic solution of how you think about um, securing our open source software. And it's not just a one person's responsibility, it's, it takes a lot of people, the industry, the open source maintainers, and they are thinking about this day and night. There is a group within that, uh, organized in working groups and special interest groups, and there's one called like the best practices for open source uh, developer, as as Crovus is in the front, says the best working group. So the best working group, um, they have got a lot of projects under the umbrella, one which is Scorecard, and then another one, they also put out a whole bunch of guides um, to, for example, how do you actually better um, either evaluate the open source software that you're consuming or actually if you're creating open source software, how can you do this better? So it, it naturally fit this, uh, this working group to work on this source code management best practices guide. So we jumped in, uh, as I said, we gave him feedback. Um, and then uh, we, uh, so this is kind of like the, it was like it formally uh, launched last week. And what it is, is you can go in and actually look at a, a long list of um, things that you should or should not be doing. Uh, it's grouped under what you should be thinking about if you're an enterprise, an organization level, and a repo level. And a lot of different things that if you click into the links, it'll, t it'll give you uh, the remediation steps. But alongside that, they also have a tool that you can run, a uh, Legitify and Scorecard, and there's examples of things that you should be looking at, which can then guide you into, first of all, seeing what's going on, and then um, go from there. So I'm gonna switch um, and show you uh, some of these things in action so you get a, a better intuition and a sense of how this all works together. So. Let's see. And I'm not going to do full demo mode because that, 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 would, that would take, yeah. 
Yeah, okay. But I actually spent some time uh, a couple of days ago with uh, a sample project that I put in. And I'll just quickly show you. Um, is, this, is this viewable from the back? Okay, so this is like a, a test organization that I created called Demogod's Rule. And um, it's, uh, I quickly show you that I haven't actually configured too much in terms of this organization. And if you go into GitHub, there are things that you can do around member privileges. Like, for example, in here, if you are like an OSPO, there are certain things that you should or should not be doing in general. Like, don't just let anybody like, create a public repo, especially if it's an organization that you care about, your flagship. So there's certain things that you can do, like set the base permissions to, for example, none or uh, no permissions as a baseline. And then nobody can do anything. And from there, then you can start like, uh, um, just like incrementally like turning on so that maybe if somebody wants to create a repo, they actually have to come talk to you. Maybe you want to do that, maybe you don't. But if you do that, then, you know, for example, don't allow members to create public repos. There's a bunch of different things. And to, your, to my point earlier, there's a lot of knobs and things that you like, what should I be turning on or not? There are things that you can do around like planning and automation. What are some of like the defaults? Uh, you can turn on um, security, things related to code security and scanning, and some things that you can do at an organization level, and some things that you can do at a repo level. So I'm going to show you, like, for example, I, took, I created a repo under DG Rule, a very simple repo. It's a JavaScript project that all it does is that you can actually, it's just basically testing continuous integration, as mindless as it, it can be. So starting off with this project, um, uh, all you can do is uh, very little things, but at very least, it had, God bless us, we actually had a license file and a code of conduct, and uh, that was about it, and uh, dependencies in the package, very limited dependencies, nothing <laughs> kind of major. And then I just kind of like took it through the spaces. I was kind of curious, how is this, with this very basic thing, how is it going to do against, say, uh, scorecard? And um, actually, before that, I want to actually like show how you could run scorecard. So running scorecard is pretty, it's pretty easy. So you, in, in Mac, you just like install it through brew, or you can actually run it from a command line, and you can run it through uh, an action. But if you want to uh, run scorecard, this is in the uh, repo that I just showed you, it'll go in and it'll run like a bunch of different checks, um, like branch protection, is there a license? Are you actually trying to get a best practices badge, which is another project under the OpenSSF? Do you have code review? Are you doing code reviews? Do you have like some dangerous uh, tokens going on? And I'll just spit out like a, an example here. And this is this project after we've kind of like fixed it. So if you look at this, you'll see uh, there's some like waiting and some things are more like more important than others. Like it'll see if you've got any binary artifacts checked in. You can see it's called eight out of 10 on branch protection. And this is after we'd kind of made some changes. Uh, are there more than one uh, are contributors coming from more than one organization? So doing pretty well. So with scorecard, uh, anything sort of above five, six, seven is considered like pretty good. Um, as somebody, there was like a really good uh, again a talk yesterday that dove into scorecard and went through how do you incrementally improve your score. So that's what scorecard run would look like. Uh, let's see what legitify would lo uh, look like. So legitify. Again, you can install it through um, Homebrew in, in, in the Mac case. And then you can run it on certain orgs. You can run it on, oh, by the way, you also have to like, set some kind of like a token uh, which has certain permission. But then you can run it like on an organization, on a member, on a repository, on actions, and it'll check certain things. So here I'm running it against the whole uh, org, and I'm looking for organization, member, and repository information. And then it's going to give me some information. And again, it's going to have severity around it as well. Uh, you can actually check. Let me just scroll up here. And so, for example, the default member permission should be restricted. So I showed you in the beginning that members can do just about anything. So this gives you like a hint of what you should be doing. And if you go to our, our, the guide, it's actually going to step in and say exactly what you should be thinking about doing and where you should go on GitHub and, uh, or in GitLab and, and do that as well. It says two-factor authentication should be enforced and uh, it's a very high, so you want to take care of the highs and the medium. Uh, and a lot of really good, useful information. Uh, Legitify can actually also run scorecard if you give it a certain flag as well. But a lot of these things kind of overlap with some of the things that scorecard is also checking. 
So with that in mind, between scorecard, I kind of did the exercise within this particular test repo of how do I go through and increase the score. So here, scorecard actually had it at a 7.1. That's where we ended up. But where we started was um, actually at a 3, um, or something just above a 3. So this is the initial uh, report at the, commit of, uh, at the commit where we started off. And it's got a few things in here. It's got actually um, a GitHub action that runs that does a very quick check to see if everything's going well um, using a, a testing framework called a Jest. And um, it's just doing some quickly tests. So the idea is behind that you, if you wanted to improve on this repo, you could then add, um, you could, uh, uh, add something and then you could also add a test into this Jest tracing framework. We don't need to dive into that. The key thing is in here is that when you first run it, uh, I'm going to show you some of the results, uh, and just to, in the interest of time, I'm just going to scroll through and just show you a couple of things that uh, we got from the scorecard run. So from the first scorecard run, uh, let's see, we scored a 3.5 in the very early repo, and if you scroll through this, branch protection was not on, so it was a 0 out of 10. Uh, Code reviews hadn't been done. They found two unreviewed comments because uh, I was the lone maintainer at the time. And uh, then it had uh, no dangerous workflows that I couldn't find any dangerous workflow patterns. Um, the dependency update tool wasn't there. At least the license was. Um, pin dependencies, no security policies. So a good, a good flow through what is and is not, is not working well. So after that, next step in the process was, okay, um, I said, you know what, let's turn on branch protection. So branch protection, you can do this at the repo level. You can also um, enforce it later through rule sets, and I'll show that in a little bit. So just turned on branch protection on the main branch and said, I will want to require a pull request so we got our reviews. Um, require approvals, and here you can have a drop down of how many approvals you require. You can go up, the more people to, it's better. Then dismiss stale pull requests with new commits are pushed. There's a couple of things that are, should be good, and what I did is I first started a, a few, um, checked a few boxes, run scorecard, and it incrementally moved, current moved, and then at some point I'm like, okay, I've got it as good as I want it to be. So these are kind of like the, the items that, we, that were good in there. And then other thing that you can do is that you want to make sure you, if you have like uh, some tests, you just, just require static check, checks to pass before merging. And then you can go in here and figure out what should be the test that you want to require. And this corresponds to, in the example I had, um, the Jest test, so that if somebody tries to push in a code, it's going to um, not actually, it's going to block any merge requests. And then things like don't allow deletions, um, don't allow bypassing of some of the sessions. So this was the branch protection that we added onto that. And then from then, we're able to improve the scorecard uh, slightly from there. Uh, so Im Im we improved it to, let's see. Let's, get, let's see. Yeah, it, went, it improved from about 3.6 to uh, just slightly better than that. Let me go up to the top. Right, so all right, yeah. I got way too much text. Yeah, so improved to 4.6 after those changes. And then the next change is uh, look through this again. And another really easy thing to do is add a dependency uh, update. So went ahead and it was a zero out of 10 in this case. So went ahead and, and did that. And so for dependencies, um, you can add, uh, at least with GitHub, you can do this different ways, but Dependabot is a good one to do. You can say in there that I want to be notified if, uh, if I need to do any updates. It might just like bump up the versions of, uh, for example, if you've got any packages in there. So it's actually good to turn this on and see the automatic PRs come in. It can be a little annoying if you're a, if you're a developer and you get these uh, uh, Dependabots all the time, but it can actually pretty much save you. So after running it through uh, Dependabot, um, actually, actually after turning that on, was able to get the scorecard improved sli uh, slightly to a, no, that's 3.5 still though. <laughs> We're going in the wrong direction. So 4.6, and then it, it moved to a 6.2, but it moved to a 6.2, not just did I not just turn on Dependabot, but I actually added in a security uh, file as well. So a security MD, 
again, you need a way for people to actually report if there are any vulnerabilities. And I played around with this. Uh, scorecard is not perfect, but at least it was able to detect that if I just said security and I said, we want to do security, it actually checks a little bit of the text to see if there's an email for a way to get in touch with people or there's a link for further information. And that's why we were able to bump it up to a 6.2. So after doing that, the next thing I wanted to look at is um, it also said that there was something called the dangerously, dangerous workflows that tokens had actually permissions that were not good. And that can be pretty bad. So uh, somewhere in here it says uh, token permissions are, are too high. So, so here, 0 out of 10, it detected GitHub workflow tokens with excessive permissions. And so uh, for uh, my GitHub actions, I just added this line here, permissions equal to read. And uh, that means, because by default, at least maybe in that time, uh, this token, if there was like a right permission, it could go in and do uh, things that you don't want it to do. So just adding this one line here, which was pretty easy to do, was able to bump it up to um, improve it just a little bit more. And then we're able to go to uh, all the way to 7.1 after making that change. So that was, uh, uh, that's kind of like a very quick, it didn't take too long, quick and easy way to just like bump it up. And so at that point, the next thing I did is that you can, with Scorecard, actually um, add it as an action so it runs with every uh, uh, commit. So adding it, uh, it's pretty easy. You can go to the site and, and send it out there. Um, but you add, you create a secret, uh, a secret token, you add it to your repo on your org, and then you put it up there. And then at every point, you can actually get a badge. So at the end of the result, uh, what you got is a test project. You've got the just test pa passing, but you also got like a, the scorecard badge out there, which is like a good thing. If people come and look at your project, they can come and see that. Now, when you're thinking about doing this at, uh, at scale, oh, the other thing that I, I did, at least this is an example of what we did, but I created like um, these uh, scripts that could go and run these uh, legitify or scorecard and do it, bring, give us JSON, because at the end of the day, I want to make sure we can put it somewhere where people can look at it. So I uh, had a, a bunch of scripts I would put together. So some of the information, um, used GitHub um, API and GraphQL to get some of the insights that could be useful. Uh, get the legitify uh, information in, in JSON, and you can do that as well. You can also get scorecard uh, on, on each on each of the different things. So these are different things that we did. Uh, created a, a, a separate script just to be able to do all of this in one place, because at the end of the day, we might want to merge this into one UI. I want to touch on a few things that uh, I wanted to do in terms of if you're doing that on an OSPERT scale, I'm not sure if you want to go and check every box uh, and do this branch protection. As uh, in the OpenSSF day, uh, someone from Intel talked about how they had 94 organizations and uh, 900, 900 plus repos to deal with. I'm not sure you want to do this case by case. So a couple of things that you can do if you're not already doing it, you could actually create, um, you could create like a template repositories that have, for example, all of the things you want, like security MD. And in this particular case, also added a, a workflow in there um, just for testing purposes that also had the depender bot in there by default and also had the scorecard uh, action by default, so every new project could potentially have a scorecard um, badge in the beginning. And then the other thing is that for things that are important, like branch protection, uh, GitHub allows you, if you have an enterprise, to uh, set up rule sets on an organization level. And then you could set it up, but you could also do it in such a way that it's, it's only in evaluation mode, so you can just see who is actually uh, which of your repos are actually got branch protection on before you actually try to enforce it. So that's a good way to do things at scale, at least from the, the GitHub point of view. Um, so that's kind of like a quick uh, section, so you kind of have like a sense of what it, what it looks like. So I'm going to go back to the presentation and continue. So, so, um, so now that we've kind of like gone through the requirements, we're in the implementation phase. We've completed review with at least the initial stakeholders, and we want to expand this across to uh, different, different teams as well and uh, see if we can set this up for our, our initial uh, repos and our strategic orgs. And then eventually after that, we are planning to do things where we train some of the maintainers on how we can, do, uh, we can actually make sure that we are staying compliant with some of the things that we've set up. And as we do that, we're going to refine based on this initial phase what we want to do for the next phase when we expand it across 
We want to make sure that we are complying across our different um, orgs as well. And I'm always in favor of building automation and getting out of the way as much as you can and making sure people can do things safely. So what are the automated tools that we can build? What are the dashboards that we can put out there to incentivize people to actually uh, do the right thing? And we also want to do a yearly review. There are other tools that we're looking uh, at as well. Um, Chaos is a community that thinks about open source metrics. And there are some things that we can learn from there in terms of how do you work in the community or what are the different things that you would want to show in this dashboard. Repo status is just uh, it's really related to how do you signal to the community that a repo, through a badge, uh, what state your repo is in. And repo linter is another tool within the to-do group that can check on community files like license and some of the other things if you wanted to kind of like dive in deeply into the the actual files themselves and look at it deeply. And those are some of the things that we want to use to gate before we release a project. And then hopefully we can get as many of our strategic projects with like a best practices badge on, on their page. Uh, and because just going through the exercise of best practices can, can teach you a lot. I've got a couple of projects going through them and they're actually learning a lot by, oh, I need a CI, <laughs> thing, things like that. Uh, the SCM guide is continuing to work, uh, working on this even after the launch. We want to hear from the community. What are you thinking about what we put out? Uh, what are the use cases that can uh, show us how we can do better? Uh, different tools that we can look at because uh, uh, not everything works perfectly, but there could be other tools out there that we could look at. And if there are additional platforms beyond just GitLab and Git, GitHub, want to see what is the criteria from including them in there. Quickly closing out with some of the lessons that we've learned. Just got a lot of invaluable help, whether it was with the OpenSSF or some of the to-do group where we would bounce ideas off. You want to learn from the community and share in the community. Even as we were building this, um, it was just so useful to be talking to other people who are experts in this field. And in terms of as we were going through the process, um, because there's so many people involved um, in this, you want to involve the right stakeholders at the very right time. And I mentioned before, get to hear from different people who are using GitHub in different ways. And hear, hear exactly, you might initially say, I don't really agree with how you're doing it, but it might actually be completely valid. You got like demo projects, only orgs, you've got, and you probably want to apply different types of security policies to each. So just getting to know what it, people are doing is really important. And anything that you're doing in terms of like the guidelines and documents, see if you can support it with the tooling. Not all tools are perfect, but you know what? There's, if we kind of like work together, I think over time, we'll, we'll have like a, a better way to think about all these things. And also plan for automation and scale. Um, like I said, whether you're using a template repository or actually using rule sets, think about if you're an OSPO and you're managing so many of this, what can you be thinking about? Hopefully some of the things that I've learned, uh, I've shared, are going to be things that you can actually take and apply it to your own use case, because definitely you want to make sure that as a community, you are also doing your own part in this. The OpenSSF, um, there, are, there are lots of talks uh, and resources that you can actually dive in to learn more about that. We'd love to welcome you into the Source Code uh, Management Guide project, um, because, uh, for example, we need a lot more people who know have, have actually GitLab. So a lot of us are GitHub, 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 but we definitely want people, there are a lot of projects out there on GitLab. If you are an OSPO that is using GitLab, please join us and just uh, give us your experience and help us prove out what we've actually put out there. We meet every other Thursday. Next meeting is October uh, 5th. Um, so definitely, um, I'm really grateful to come here and be able to share what we've learned. Uh, we, we hope that... Uh, we can all together just like make open source a lot more secure. And I know it's not just F5 that is going to be doing this. It's the collective effort. Uh, hopefully this has been useful for you. And uh, thank you so much for your time.